So welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to MM7 and our webinar of the day. And it's a privilege and honor to have um, Marjorie Rosenberg with us, who is a very passionate educator and also uh, the ITEFL president. I sometimes wonder, Marjorie, you don't have to answer right now, uh, where you get your energy and if there's a recipe for it in all that you do. And if there is, maybe you'd like to write a book about it, how to manage mm. so many arms, <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> like being an octopus. I mean, you know, if you think positively about an octopus and being able to manage uh, so many areas and, and do so much both face-to-face uh, -face and online. Uh, I think that um, you're engaged um, very strongly in both. So as you can see, uh, Marjorie is originally from the United States, from New Jersey, but she's been, um, I believe, out of the States for um, most of her life. And uh, she's currently in Austria. She's um, been teaching EFL in Austria for 34 uh, years. Uh, she trains teachers, corporate clients, uh, and she's involved in what's called NL. P, which is uh, neuro linguistics. Uh, what's the P? Practitioner. Programming. Oh, programming. Right. Programming. Yeah, um, which is really interesting. I sometimes wonder why you don't uh, give more uh, training in that. But I believe that um, most people who are trained uh, professionals in NLP do not uh, do this freely. Am I right? <laughs> It's something that, uh, I don't know, that's the impression I get. Not not the you personally, but uh, but there are books out there that people can um, follow. But the training is uh, very extensive, and I believe it's really worth worthwhile if anybody's interested in making changes in their lives and in their mm -hmm. students' lives with NLP. Um, she's also uh, published books and articles on business English and methodology. She, I think her baby, if I'm not, correct me if I'm wrong, is uh, learning styles and uh, learner types, which I think you're developing as an alternative to what's called learning styles um, as such. And uh, you can see that she's uh, was the current ITEFL business uh, SIG coordinator and she's been a member of ITEFL for a number of years. Uh, TESOL as well, uh, Marjorie, or just um, ITEFL? No, just uh, ITEFL. I think that's enough, right? Um, <laughs> and TESOL is more American. ITEFL, I believe, is more uh, British. And I see Fabiana's here. Um, yeah, I've... That's great. All right, so feel free to uh, share the link with your friends. I, th I think uh, many people might have missed uh, or uh, forgotten about the session today. So Marjorie, I am going to pass on. Um, we actually have a poll, don't we, to start? I think we have a poll. Is this how I open it? Not sure yet. Looks like it's loading. Can everyone hear me okay? Can you put that in the chat box? And could you fill in the poll? Could you submit what you, your answer here? It is grayed out, so I can't see anything. Okay, I see it. But my screen is sort of grayed out. I don't know if that's because the poll is up. Have people filled in the poll? Okay, great. I don't see it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Okay, now, all right, okay, great. So I can then start. Thank you. So I got into learning styles or learning preferences because when I was in high school, we had to have a foreign language. I took French, thought it would be wonderful. They spoke to us for the first six weeks, told us not to picture the words. The first time I saw Kestisay written, that was the end of my career in French. I had another two to three years of it, including university, never managed to learn it. And I had no idea why. I then moved to Austria and it wasn't easy, but I did learn German in about three years or so. I was able to communicate, which I was thrilled about. And basically, I didn't understand what the problem was until I went on a training course and found out this. I had no idea that we learned in different ways. I thought I just couldn't learn a foreign language. So this got me very interested in what happens in our students and do they have these problems and led to beginning to research and to look into learning styles, learning preferences, working through a variety of ways and doing a research. Uh, is it speaking to learning a foreign language? No, of course not. But this is what we do is teach foreign languages. Um, other subjects I learned more easily. Math I always also had problems with. But so much of it was because I'm a very visual learner. And when it wasn't visualized, I had problems. So let's take a look at what this actually is. What are learning types? So they are filters. They, they influence the way we take in information. They also have to do with how we actually realize that information is around us, how we store it, and how we remember it. I often realize that I need a picture to remember something. Not always, but can happen. They're also cognitive processing, which we're going to get to. It's also how we organize the material once we have actually taken it in. It's the approaches that people use, and it's the way they behave in learning. I am sure if you observe students, you will see that some students do something in one way, and some students do things in another way. It, you see it every time you hand out a pair work activity or a, an activity involving small groups. They tend to organize themselves in different ways. So let's take a look at what this means for the classroom. It's my contention, and I am sure that classes have a variety of types. You may have a lot of people who learn in the same way, but you're going to have a few who are slightly different. And because we're all learners as well as teachers, we teach in the way we learn. I tend to write a lot on the board. I use different colors. I have colleagues that don't do this at all because they don't think it's necessary. And when we mix our methods, we simply reach more learners. So I'm not saying we have to teach to one type, but we need to use different things. Yesterday, for example, I worked on past progressive and present perfect with, with one group of students. We began with uh, past progressive. I've explained it. And then we did an old game by, uh, by Jill Hadfield, Fishy Stories, if anyone remembers this. You have times of the day, and they get cards, and they have to say, what were you doing at 9 o'clock AM on Sunday? And then they have a picture in their hand, and they have to say, I was whatever, taking part in a parade. I was feeding my dog. And they practice over and over with this. So this was a card game. This was working together in groups. And then we did Have You Ever? which was pair work, where they had actual questions to ask each other that they had to fill in, and it was compared to past tense. So this was a little more analytic. They were working with a partner, so they were getting that interest, but they were using pieces of paper and pens rather than simply a card game. And then we took it out to the whole class, and I said, how long have you had your watch? So then I made it even more personal, and we were talking about things they own. Sorry, very dry here. <coughs> so it's very important as well to help the learners stretch out of their style. Sorry. <coughs> and when they stretch, they can begin to develop successful strategies. And as Tessa Woodward says, 
when we harmonize with them, we reach them where they are, and then we can challenge them. If we challenge them first, we might lose them along the way. And when they understand this, they begin to get more insight. And they also become more tolerant, accepting the way others do things. Anyone have any questions with my voice a chance here to rest? <coughs> I'm just saying hi. I don't see any questions. Okay. okay let's go on. <coughs> okay, there's a lot of talk about preferences and styles and people saying it doesn't work. Well, they're not supposed to work. They just are. But what they aren't, they are not an excuse. Just because you are not auditory like me does not mean that we are not supposed to learn to listen. You can't say, I can't do that. That's it. That doesn't help. They are not pigeonholes. We do not put our students into categories and say, you are only going to learn this because you are this type. Not true. They're not right or wrong. It might be easier to learn something, it might be easier to get a good accent in a foreign language if you're very auditory, it doesn't mean that they're right or wrong. <coughs> they are not limitations. We all can stretch. There's no right mix, yeah. They do not indicate competence. It is fascinating to see the different styles in my classroom, and some are good B1s, some are low B1s, some actually are B2s. It has nothing to do with their style. And they are not judgmental. Nobody is better or worse than someone else. So we're going to take a look today at three models. The first one is sensory perception, which we call VAK, visual auditory kinesthetic. And according to Andrew Cohn, who's done a lot of research into this, these are the three models that he talks about. First, how we perceive things. Secondly, how we cognitively process them, which is your global and analytic. And then how we actually behave in learning situations. And the model I use here is called mind organization. We are going to make the questionnaires available to you. I've got questionnaires for each of these styles that you can determine your own style after the webinar. We are all one in all factors. Yes, it does absolutely make sense. They all coexist. And you'll see that as we go on. So let's start with the VAK model. Now the standard one includes visual, auditory, and kinesthetic, which you're going to see in a minute. But in working with this, with a colleague, we did a lot of teacher training, and she worked with kids in a high school for many, many years, especially those having problems learning. We realized that at some point, we think possibly pu puberty, the kinesthetic motoric, so the movement, separates from the emotional. When kids are smaller, they seem to be very together. I was much more movement-oriented as a child. I'm now not very movement-oriented, but definitely kinesthetic emotional. So this is how we face it. And to show you the standard model, this is the next slide. This is the way we usually look at it. But the reason for this slide is to show you in the center. If you see this VAK in the blue, when we are not stressed, we have access to all of them. I see it when I'm on the beach, in Crete. I can listen to things and read at the same time. It doesn't interfere. I can hear the kids in the background speaking different languages. I can hear music. It doesn't bother me. But when I'm home and trying to concentrate, music goes off. Door to my office gets closed. I need quiet because I'm in a more stressful situation. And what happens to our learners? When do they get stressed? They get stressed when we ask them a question. They get stressed in the exam. And that's when they tend to revert to their preferred style. Now, they may revert to two. They might go to visual and auditory or auditory and kinesthetic. But there's a good chance that one of those perceptual channels will be less prominent and may actually be blocked. It's possible. So to show you another way to find out what your students are, now you may not have time to test them. You might notice things. And one thing we can notice is handwriting. 
I was doing this exact lesson with a group of pre-service teachers. They were, I guess, 17, 18 years old. And this was examples of their handwriting. This is a visual handwriting example. Uh, this is actually from a university student who answered by hand questions to a text. And if you notice, she underlined the questions. Her handwriting is very even. This is typical visual handwriting. To me, it actually looks like primary school, but she was, I think, 2021 20, studying IT. And this is the one from the student in the class I was doing, where she tried to copy my little chart with the VAK. And the interesting thing she did here was when she underlined words, she didn't draw the line through letters that went below. So if there was a J, she underlined, she stopped, and then she kept going. For some reason, this bothered her. And she organized everything very carefully on the page. Does everyone see that? You know it, I think. Yeah. And you might notice this with your students. Now, the same class, another female student, same age, and this was an auditory student, and you're going to see the difference. Does that look different? Does it look familiar to anyone? Yeah. Auditories also don't always take notes. I was lucky to get any, but that's, you see the huge difference in the way they organize their, their text, the way they write, and so on. Okay. And now, this is an adult. I was lucky to get this kinesthetic. Style, I would say this is more motoric than, than emotional, but very typical. This planner from a kinesthetic learner. We took this out of her planner, took it to Costco, it was in the States, and had a, uh, no, Kinko, and had it copied immediately, one of the copy places. And the interesting thing is that kinesthetics tend to make boxes around things because it makes things more physical. They have the feeling they can lift it off the page. When it's just written there, it, it's very abstract for them. And then the crossing out when something is done gives them a wonderful feeling. I tend to tick things off, but if I'm really happy it's done, I will do the crossing out. Some people don't make lists at all. Sometimes I will write things down just for the joy of, of ticking them off, but for me it's more of a visual thing. But this is very clearly kinesthetic. She also doesn't stay in the lines, as you can see. Okay, so let's take a look at the characteristics of the different types. We're going to go through this just so you have an idea. And as I said, you can do the surveys afterwards. Now, your visual learners will be the ones that say, can you please write that on the board? I need to write words to check spelling. My students do it less in German because German is said the way it is spelled, but English certainly isn't. Which is all related? Yeah, probably. The visuals will take notes in class so they can look at them later. And they really like to get handouts and different kinds of visual materials. Their handwriting is usually pretty good. If it's not, le it's not always 100% legible, but it's very even. And they spend time on it. They're the ones that have the, the colors with them, the highlighters. I always ask my students at the beginning. I had one girl once with 49 different um, writing utensils, and they may draw ideas to remember them. Now, their big problem is that they learn things where they see it. So they'll remember, that was at the top of the page. Then they, the test comes, and that question about that thing is at the bottom of the page, and they might forget what they learned. So they need to get things off the page, put them on little flashcards or something, and learn it again in a different order. Does that make sense to everyone? It's an excellent tip to give your visual learners. Yeah? Great. OK, now, visual teachers. So we learn by watching. That's basically what we need to do. And we do use visual aids. Uh, 
we like vis visually stimulating environments. When I was teaching in the U.S., I was a music teacher, and I came into the classroom, and there was a bulletin board there, and it had old uh, covers of library books. It drove me crazy. Absolutely crazy. I was a music teacher. I loved every month making a bulletin board of the topic of the music for the month that we were doing. It was so important to me to look at that board and see it. Whether the kids looked at it, I have no idea. But I couldn't teach in that room with that bulletin board with the old library book covers because they meant nothing. And I wanted something nice. And we'll spend time making handouts. We'll spend time, if we photocopy, then cutting it out and then copying it again so that it's not, you know, you don't have the black edges, that it's not crooked. These kinds of things bother us. I used to use color-coded systems. I had, I used to do a lot of songs. I would have them copied in pink, uh, on pink paper. My grammar was all yellow. The grammar exercises were green, and so on. And my students always knew it was coming. And we may use mind maps. Any questions here? Does anything sound familiar? Do you do anything else if you think you're a visual type of teacher? They take photos. Ah, uh, yes. ELT picks the best, and that's coming. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Let's, yes, photos help. I agree. So, taking a look at the auditory learners. Now, they can be a bit problematic in class because they often need to speak to remember. If they just listen, that's fine. But the ones that need to repeat everything to themselves or to a partner can be problematic. And we have to recognize that. I talk to them privately. I tell them I understand it, but it's disturbing others. But they may sub-vocalize, so you know, speaking like this. Or they might move in rhythm. I always thought that was kinesthetic. It's actually visual, uh, auditory if they're in rhythm. They don't often take notes. And a young man once asked my colleague, who was doing training with the group, if she could write a, a confirmation for him to his teacher that he never needs to take notes. She said, sorry, out of luck. I'm also auditory. I had to learn to do it. But it's not their style. They love the discussions. They often listen to music while learning. My partner is auditory. And the music goes on in his office. Our offices are opposite sides of the apartment because mine is quiet. But they can repeat back what they heard. Now, the problem is, if they study at home with a parent, they go through all of their material out loud, they remember it in that order. It's like a tape recorder. And then, so they've learned a whole thing of information, and the teacher asks something about the middle part of that. It's like rewinding a tape to remember what they learned, so they need to write this down and to also store it visually. Because tests are usually visual. There are some oral, but many are visual. And they might need to pick something out from the middle of the tape they've got in their head. Does that make sense? Yes, great. Okay, going on to the next to the auditory teachers. Now, they obviously teach the speaking in this end. And this colleague that I work with who is auditory, we got to a seminar room once and there was no flip chart. And I went, ah, no flip chart. And she said, who needs a flip chart? And we looked at each other and started laughing because we realized she's the auditory. I'm the visual. First thing I need. And they might rely on other things to get the message across. They may not use the board. They like to use music rhymes, raps. They love class discussions. They're most likely the ones that are working on pronunciation. And storytelling. I also like stories, but more for the emotional. That's the thing. That's why I like to tell stories, not so much because it's auditory. Any questions here? Okay. And I can tell you a story about my brother in law, who's an auditory teacher. He did a teacher training for a week. He did not hand out the handouts to the last day because he thought it would distract them and it drove the people crazy. They kept saying, where is, where are the handouts? I need the handouts. And he thought it was only going to get in the way. Okay. Very interesting how these things work. Okay, let's take a look at the kinesthetic emotional learners. These are the ones that really need, I'm trying to 
see the chat. I'm on my laptop, which is smaller. Uh, like this. Mm. Like she circled. Oh no, that's the old one. Okay, I can't see it. Um, they see. They really need to like the people. They may choose to work with one person rather than another. And learning has got to have positive feelings. I cannot tell you how many adults I have had that have negative feelings about learning. And this carries over into the classroom. And the most important thing for me is to change that. They personalize their, their learning materials. I give all my students stickers, including members of the board that I teach in a corporation. They all get stickers. I have given government officials stickers. They love them. And they become personal for them. Um, they probably need to find their own reasons for learning. But they also like to be able to be creative, but they need to know that there's somebody who's going to help them. In the classroom, they do, or in learning in general, they need to be able to put those emotions aside. They need to know that they can also learn from a teacher they may not like that much. And that is very difficult for them. Does that sound familiar to anyone? I'm going to go on to the kinesthetic emotional teachers. Yeah, we, we teach using feelings and, and intuition. Uh, I had to make up a class yesterday because I got stuck in the London fog a few weeks ago on a Friday afternoon. I was so grateful for the students for coming. And it was, you know, knowing I was going into the weekend, it just made the class so much fun. And I realized how much I really still enjoy teaching after 34 years. Telling them stories, enjoying it. Then using activities which encourage the personal and emotional input is wonderful. I've, I asked them to write stories about the first time they did something. I got the most wonderful stories. I was reading them last night. Sometimes they make me cry. They're just beautiful stories. But we also notice the moods. We notice when the class is not feeling well, when there's something going on, when there's a so-called elephant in the room. And of course, why copy? OK. Um, creativity, and these personal stories. I can remember watching the film. If anyone hasn't seen it, have a look. The Mirror Has Two Faces with Barbara Streisand. And it's Jeff Bridges. And she is a teacher who comes in and talks about her life. And this lecture hall is packed, totally packed to the ceiling with students who come in to listen. And then she relates it to what she's teaching. And this is something I feel is so important, to come in and tell them stories that relate to something I'm trying to get across. And of course, we want a harmonious atmosphere in class. Very important to us. So the learners. These are the ones that have trouble sitting still. They are the ones. Uh -huh. Why are my, hmm. There you go. There you go. Uh, they might. Look in their school bag for something. They're the ones that might be playing with a, you know, a marker or a pen or something. They want to try things out. They need. They they always relate things to real life, and they learn well with manipulative. So when you give them something they can touch, uh, one activity I have is I put things in a bag and they have to feel things through the bag and guess what's in there. They love it because it's real. I used to teach nutrition students and we would cook together. And this is the most amazing lesson because they are much better in the kitchen than I am. They can feel if dough is ready or not to roll out. I'm measuring everything. But they were teaching me and they are incredibly kinesthetic. But the problem is that they may learn by walking around and they need to get that written down. At home they might learn, you know, they can't sit longer than 30 minutes usually or they start playing with everything on the desk. But they do need to get things written down. Okay, any questions about this before we go on to cognitive? So why can't kids enjoy classroom learning? Nellie, is there a way I can make the chat bigger on my small screen? I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. Ah. Okay. 
Okay, got it, got it, got it. Yep, yep, got it. Okay, I've got it. All right, wonderful. Now I can actually read what you guys are writing. This is great. Notes look like drawings. Okay, you're all in one, all factors. Okay, so I saw some of these stress. Yeah. Key factor, absolutely great. Okay, wonderful. All right, then I'm going to I want my students to be happy. I agree, Fabi, absolutely. All right, let's go on. Oh, the, the teachers, obviously. The kinesthetic motoric teachers are the ones that, you know, they'll, they love to move around in the classroom. They probably never sit down. Um, lots of miming and role plays. And they may demonstrate things physically. I'm not that good at that, so I don't. And, of course, the real-life experiences. And they use all these manipulatives, which are, it could be anything. Cards, anything students touch is a manipulative. Okay, let's go on to the cognitive, which is global analytic. Now, in general, the global learners are those who use their emotions. They see the whole picture, whereas the analytics are the ones that are more in their heads and looking at details. So if you get to do these PDFs that we have here afterwards, you'll get an idea of where you are. So let's have a look at this. So global learners will remember the whole experience rather than the details, which of course then they run into the problems on standardized tests. They might remember the whole thing, how it worked, but exactly what the details were is not so easy. They also prefer to try things out. We're the ones that generally, and also global, uh, tend to start before we read the instructions. Does that sound uh, familiar to anyone? Okay. Anyone jump in before you read the instructions? And they perceive everything holistically. And when they work in a group, they are relationship oriented. That's clear. They like to please others, and the feelings are just more. Yeah, when all else fails, read the instructions. I hear that on a daily basis. Uh, so the feelings are more important, and they tend to be more spontaneous. But they also need to learn to take criticism or maybe hints on what to do without attaching the emotions. It is so difficult for us. And if we take a look at the teachers, I don't know what that was in the background, they may give more general than specific goals. You know, you will learn to speak well rather than say you will learn to take this test or you will learn these tenses. And very specific personal examples when we explain things. We do not get too analytic about things. We will give an example. We love student-centered classrooms, group work, cooperative learning. And this one's very important. We generally have a plan for the lesson, but we stay flexible. At my university, we were told to set up a syllabus and give it to the students on the first day, what we're doing on the first day, second day, third day, fourth day. I couldn't do it. Thing. Somebody asked a question. We got into some discussion. I have a colleague that has no problem doing it. So I was excused from doing it because I simply couldn't stick to it. I cover my syllabus, but I may do it in a different order than I thought back in September when I get to December. Something happens. And this is a very typical thing for a global teacher. It also is not a problem for us. And we like this discovery method, having the students figure things out. So having a look then at analytic learners, they're going to perceive things much more detailed. They remember the specifics. They might want to work alone. And sometimes I ask, you can do this alone or with a partner, and I have them, they choose. They're self-motivated. They want to get started with that task. They don't need all the chit-chat at the beginning of, a, of group work. They just want to get going with it. Facts are more important, and criticism it doesn't bother them in the same way. But they might get hung up on detail. And they miss the overview. I've had students who come up with questions. I think, why are you asking this? Does anybody need to know this? It's because they got stuck on a fact. And we're going to get to that later again. Any questions about these two? Recording, OK. 
a couple of people typing. Ah, okay, good to hear that, Bobby. Okay, good. So let's go on. Oh, the analytics teacher, sorry. My global thing kicking in. Giving the, oh, no, we did this. No, oh, sorry. Specific goals, emphasis on reflection. Yeah. Deductive giving rules first. Um, being very strict about accuracy. I tend to be less strict. I tend to give more points for interesting writing. Accuracy is not the most important thing for me. Um, it's called Spotlight on Learning Styles. I don't know the person's name because it's numbers. Um, they definitely follow the syllabus in their plan. Logic puzzles. I do some, but if I can't solve them myself, I never do them. Critical thinking skills, and they might like more individual work. Yes, Bobby, with analytic and global, absolutely you can be going back and forth. I tend to become more analytic when I was somebody who's more global than I am, strangely enough. And I become more global when someone's more analytic than I am. No idea how that works, but it does. But you can be, I have a lot of students right in the middle, and they use some things for some and some for others. Do the survey. You, you have it anyway. You have it in the book. Use it in the book. Okay. Ah, Matthias. Great. Okay. So, going on. I wonder if my mouse just stopped working. No. Ah. Nelly, can you move to the next slide? I think my mouse just stopped working. Okay. I don't know. Maybe the battery died, and I don't want it to go look for a battery. Okay. Now, this is a specific, uh, or what can I call it, a model that a colleague of mine put together. Did a lot of research with adolescents on this and adults, and she called it mind organization. And some people perceive concretely through their senses. Others perceive abstractly through their thoughts and emotions. And then some organize systematically, one, two, three, four, five. Others non-systematically, very randomly. And then we get four different styles. So the, those who perceive concretely are organized systematically are power planners. The ones who organize non-systematically we call radical reformers. That's what April called them. And then the, those who perceive abstractly, we have expert investigators and flexible friends. So let's go on to the next one. Yeah, my, my mouse is definitely not working. Oh, wait, I can do it on the computer. I've got it. Oops. OK. So power planners. They are very organized. For me, this is Hillary Clinton. And she's been planning her campaign since Bill left office. They're very hardworking. They've got that goal in mind. They are perfectionists, like expert investigators. We'll get to that. Um, but they do get things done quicker. They work step by step. And they want you to give them exact instructions. They love the routines and structure. They're not happy if things change. They want to know what's expected. I always put on Moodle what we did in class, and I had students who wanted to know what was coming. <laughs> some didn't care at all, but some wanted to know. <coughs> so you can see they need to learn to accept change and other people's points of views. I'm using the computer mouse to change. <coughs> and it is not doing it. Okay. Oh, now we can go this. Okay, I don't know what's going on. Eh? So the teachers, yeah, I don't know. There we go. Yeah, I'm gonna let you do it because mine. Is stan robi te ruj na tebe. Nešto mi. Baš si zločest ti postal. Da da. Pita pita. Samo ti pita pita. Kako bi znao da ne pitaš? Okay. We had this in the web conference where people can you still hear me? Yeah, okay. 
So the teachers, they said they've got their plan. They may note how long activities should take, and then they stop them. They're extremely well organized. Uh, they try to make sure that the handouts are perfect. They do expect instructions to be followed, and they've got the goal of the lesson in mind. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Anyone fit that profile? Typing. Ah, that's what it is. Okay, more or less. Okay. All right, I'm going to go on to the, the next one. Trying. Yeah. So, expert investigators. Now, these are these are more in their head than the power planners. The power planners um, perceive concretely, but these guys perceive abstractly. So, they're more analytic. They are very logical. They will. They can bowl you over with their logic. They may not always be here on Earth with us, but they are extremely logical and very rational. They miss the emotion sometimes. And to some extent, this is Obama. To some extent, this is one reason he has trouble connecting at times. Not all the time, but sometimes. But they love research. They're very exact. They might not believe everything, a little skeptical, like to gather information. Abstract ideas are easy for them, but they need a lot of time, partially because of the research. They don't finish. I have this right now with somebody I'm working with who missed the deadline by, oh, we're going on a year because he's still researching. But they also like to work alone, and they may need to learn to work with others in the class. Yeah, um, this is my TS. When you do the survey, have a look, because especially the mind organization, there's a radar chart, which then shows you where you are. And you might find that you are really right in the middle of two styles. Very possible. So, and those teachers, they will do research for lessons. I do not spend a lot of time on this, only if I'm asked. Very abstract explanations. They love the complicated questions. They, they find it a challenge. Critical thinking, uh, language rules, which I don't tend to, to do very much of. I do more of specific things, of examples. They need to feel they are experts, and the learners want to learn from experts. They also take a lot of time to prepare very carefully. Right, let's have a look then at the radical reformers. This is normally the smallest group. These are risk takers. This is Bill Clinton. He definitely takes chances. Very curious. They may be a little more competitive and strong will. And for them, they want to be considered unique. This is really important for them. They are very persuasive and inspiring. If you ever heard Bill speak, he, he can persuade people very well. And they need the real life experiences. But in class, they need to learn to fit in while keeping that individuality. Does this sound familiar to anyone? Welcome, Sonia. Sound familiar to anyone? They're normally the smallest group in your class. They will also do things to disrupt the routine. So they are the kid at whatever age that brings a mouse in and lets it out just to see what will happen. They love things like fire drills because it breaks up the routine. OK, so the teachers. They will spend time looking for new ways to, to present things. They get bored if they teach the same way all the time. And they are not the ones that are going to go through a course book, exercise one, two, three, four, and so on. Never brought my nice to class. Okay. But you know what I mean about deviating from the syllabus. Um, they might enjoy com competition in the classroom. I tend to avoid it to some extent, although this is my second style, but I'm not competitive. But they do like to be in leadership positions, which I have found, yes, yeah, Nellie probably is, with a certain amount of analytic stuff there as well. It can be good for younger learners. It was just a discussion about this. It depends on, on the learner. I always felt uncomfortable when I, when I was not good at something and somebody else was much better. It may depend. can inspire them. It can also make them say, I'm giving up. 
they notice uniqueness in the learners. They try to be inspiring, real life experiences, and they really enjoy a challenge. And then going on to what my main style is, which is here, and Nellie will recognize this right away, are the flexible friends. When I was teaching pre-teaching, pre-teachers or pre-service teachers for primary school, I had mostly flexible friends, the ones that want to teach primary school. They want to be around people, very creative and imaginative. They're the ones that love, you know, putting things together and making things and working with small children and doing all this very sensitive, compassionate, spontaneous, flexible, idealistic, and they make decisions with their heart. And sometimes in class, they need to learn to get away from the personal stuff. Not easy for them, but they might need to learn to do it. And those teachers, yeah. oh, there we go. Very interested. This is my main style. I am interested in my students. I, I find it fascinating finding out where they're from, why they're, what they're studying, why they're studying that, what goes on in their lives. It is so interesting for me. Most of the homework I give has to do with personal things that they've experienced because I find it interesting. And use, using personalized materials, sharing feelings and emotions, showing compassion in the classroom, working with other colleagues, and striving for harmony. Very important. And yes, we are a mix of these types. But we very often tend to fit into one more than the other. Okay, we're going to go on then. Some people, I tend to be a flexible friend teacher, but with some people, it's hard to keep pretending. Um, what do you, this is Matthias, right? What do you mean? I think it was the spinner of the group. Uh huh. Yeah. Could, could you explain the pretending and the spinning? Because I'm not sure what that means. Joining with everyone personally, yes. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure about this uh, pretending part. Give it a minute. No, of course you can't. And that's what I said at the beginning. We mix and match. A teacher is not a friend. That is very true. And we're also not their mothers. But we can still show that we like our students. They are not my friends. I don't go out with them after class and have dinner or a drink. But I can still show that I like them as people, which is important to me as a flexible friend teacher. And that's the difference. And can, even considering the huge age group difference we have, I mean, have students call you mom. Now, these are the ones that say, nobody told me about the homework. You know, you expect me to come over and explain it to you. No. I expect them to have a certain amount of autonomy, but I still can show that I like them. Yeah, some students don't have a problem learning from teachers they don't like if they consider them experts. And we tend to, to think of this in the way we are ourselves. So that's why I'm presenting all the different styles here. Because there is a difference. A situation came up when I was working at the teacher training college. This is not a teaching thing. It was an organizational thing. But the uh, main administrator from the office came in, told the group she was there at 8 o'clock in the morning to do some things to do with registering for classes. She came in. Students were late. She was tapping her watch, like, 8 o'clock. Where is everybody? And they, was, they were about to burst into tears. She told them what she needed them to do. She walked out and half the group just said, she was so mean to us. She was terrible. She wasn't nice. And the couple of non-flexible friends said, what do you mean she was perfect? She told us everything we needed to know. And the argument went on between the students. She wasn't friendly. Who cares? She gave us the information. And it was so clear in that classroom that there were different learner types sitting there. And clear to, it was hundred percent clear to me. I understood why some reacted in one way and the others reacted in a different way. But they do need to learn that that's going to happen. Not everyone's going to be friendly to us. We can try, but it may not always happen. 
So let's have a look at the whole profile here. Okay. And this was a question that came up earlier. It's the process, okay. I don't know why these aren't now showing up. Okay. So when we do a complete profile, we can look at what VAK we are. Are we visual, auditory, kinesthetic, motoric, kinesthetic, emotional? How do we store information? It might even be different. We might store in a different way than we perceive. We might remember something visual that we heard. Very possible. Uh, do we need abstract ideas or do, or do we prefer concrete situations to learn? Do we use emotions or logic? How do we organize? So looking at this, we can be one of, I think it's 32 different profiles. We can be visual, analytic, and power planner. We can be visual, global, and power planner, and so on. So it changes completely depending on how these are all put together. We are not just one type. We are individuals. And that's what we have to remember about our students. So what makes activities appeal to different types? Well, use different sensory channels. I try every time I teach. I do some auditory stuff. I do some visual things. I give them a card game. I have them walk around the classroom with pieces of paper to so find somebody who. Uh, we do a, a board game where they're rolling dice. We do pair work. Uh, we do open class work. I have them fill out, fill in words. They listen to a song and fill in something. Constantly different sensory channels. Cognitive processing. I did an activity, uh, an old reward one on how long can you be. Predictions made years ago, and they had to match together the statement with who they think said it. This is cognitive. A statement like, Everything that's been invented has been invented, and they had to find who this was. It was actually the patent chief in the States in 18, 1899. So they had to use their cognitive reasoning to figure it out. Different forms of organization. <coughs> Helping our learners use their strengths. Giving them the chance to find new strategies. And accepting how they learn. That's so important. It also gives a feeling of progress. They start to see what they need and to hear what they need and to feel what they need. So we're going to go on to activities, which is the next part of this. Okay, I've broken these down into various categories. The first one are the VOK. So this very first one is what have I changed? And what happens here is very simple. You put them in pairs. They look at each other. Then they stand back to back and they change something about their appearance. Then they come back, look at each other again, and find out what has been changed. What, yeah, it's a, these are ELP picks, the best uh, source on the internet. 26 or 20, 27,000 pictures organized in categories, free for teachers to use. So, what am I practicing here? Can someone type in the chat box? Tightened. Okay. Attention to detail. Okay, I'm actually practicing grammar. What do you think? Which grammar point am I practicing? Present perfect. Yes. And Generally, what happens is I then explain why are we using present perfect? It's because this has changed and the result is important in the present. And then they get it. And there's, then there's an extension. They get together in pairs. Then they separate. You play some music. They walk around the classroom and change something without the other person seeing them. Stop the music. They come back together. Visualize past aspects. Yeah, also. Mm -hmm. And it's a great activity and there's no prep for the teacher. Okay, the next one. And oh. maybe slide. You know what to do this. Okay, the statue. Do you know what a battery is set up next to me next time I do something? This is math. Okay, so the statue. 
call them up one by one. First one makes a pose as a statue, whatever, you know, I don't know, hand on the head, whatever. Second one adds the statue, goes on till they've formed a complete statue, at which point you have a wonderful photo op if you need a photo of your student. There's a typo. Where's the typo? Okay. I have to go back and look at it. Okay. And previous slide. Okay, I'll have a look. Um, they then sit down and then they go back and recall what happened. Now, what are we practicing here? Which, which particular tense? Yeah, this is past. And what I tell them is, why is this past? Do you see a statue? Is it there? No, it's gone. So past tense is used for things that are completely finished. And because it's in their body, they actually feel it that this is over and they see it. It makes the concept of past tense easier for them to understand. Because in German, they actually don't have a difference between present perfect and past. They don't get the concept. They can learn the rules, not a problem. They can learn the, the regular and irregular verbs. That's not a problem. It's the concept that is so difficult for them. And this gives them the concept. It helps them. And then you can have them write it out. Oh, also, perfect. I love that, Nellie. That's great. Wonderful idea. Okay. So going on to the next one, which is a combination of VAK. Sorry, every time I click on this, I get something else. Can you move the slide, Nellie? It's just not working. Thank you. Okay. What happens here is they go, they work in pairs. They sit back to back. Back. One person is looking at the overhead or the screen, and the other one can't see it. The one looking at it has to describe what's going on, and the other one has to listen can ask questions and draw. So we are using all the VAK channels. Now, it's like being on the telephone, because you can't see what the person is doing. I tell them they are not allowed to see what the person is drawing, because it's too easy to say that's wrong. They have to do it all by listening. It's a listening comprehension for those who don't like listening. Of course, I pre-teach vocab. What tenses come up here? Any ideas? Thanks, too. Yeah, the drawing. Somebody gave this to me some years ago in a staff room and said, you might be able to use this. I have no idea where it came from. Yes, it's present continuous and present simple. Because, well, that's yes, you teach in Germany. It is not he is having a beard. Who has a beard? But she is wearing a fake nose. She is sitting. He is standing. She is typing. She has straight hair. And, of course, the prepositions of place, spatial prepositions. So this one works wonderfully. Um, I don't know if you get the slides. If you can make a copy of this, you're welcome to use it. If anyone ever finds out who the copyright belongs to, I'd love to know. It's wonderful. And it's all those ones. Okay, let's go on to the global analytic. Okay, so this one is actually click here. So we send two people out of the room, we choose a topic, we bring two people back in and ask them, what would you do if this happened to you? This is very global. And based on the answers they get, they should try to guess what happened because it was taking a whole picture. And the strange things that I suggest to them are two, and it's interesting. It's it's changed recently what they choose. I'm trying to get this. Okay. If it began to rain ice cream, so I start off and I say, well, I would hold an umbrella upside down. I get people that say I would go outside with a big bowl. I would, I would go outside with and open my mouth and so on. And then they have to guess what it could be. And the second one, which lately everyone has chosen, if you had to come to work in your pajamas, for some reason. And very interesting answers came up with this one recently in Poland. But people said things like, I would buy new ones, I would iron them, I would, you know, turn off the lights, all kinds of things. It was a lot of fun. And the 
global love it. It's a group thing. They're working with a partner to guess, and it's creative and crazy, and they love it. You could, of course, come up with your own. So I think there's, yeah, there's a picture. Okay. Then this one is very definitely analytic. The yes, no, hot seat. What happened to you as a volunteer thinks of an activity? The others try to guess what it is. The person answering is not allowed to say yes or no, but must find other ways to answer. And I tell them, you cannot always say the same thing. You have to find different ways. If the person says yes or no, then another volunteer comes in. This is a lot of fun. I've done it with native and non-native speakers. They find it equally difficult. And things like mowing the lawn, you know, do you do it weekly? Well, not really. Uh, do you enjoy it? Sometimes. Um, is it something you need to do? Could be. And what is this very good for training? Any ideas? It is analytic because they've got to get all that vocabulary going through their brain. Okay, great. Wonderful to hear, Father. So what are you train what can we what can we use this for? Is anyone typing? Hey, I think it's very helpful for training them to take Cambridge exams. On the speaking exam, I was an examiner for six years, you get the same answers all the time. And when they have got more vocabulary that they can use, rather than just saying yes or no, it is so good for them on those exams. Of course, for clarification. But to expand their vocabulary, also in giving presentations in the Q&A area, that they begin to find other ways to say things, especially if they don't want to say yes or no. If it's a business presentation and they are not ready to give an answer, finding another way to say it, and having practice that is very helpful. All right. And the next one in this, this I would say is both, is global and analytic. So we brainstorm jobs, any kind of jobs. And you hand out envelopes and small pieces of paper to each of them. They write their names on the envelopes and they pass their envelopes around. And the others write a job on this and put it in the envelope. And then the envelope comes back, and it's like their birthday. They open the envelope. They take out the little pieces of paper. This is really kinesthetic, which makes it wonderful. I tried it on, the paper, on, on one sheet of paper that they folded. It was not as much fun. And then they prioritize the jobs. They say, wow, wow, that would be really interesting. I'd like that. No, this is not me at all. And this combines this global and analytic thinking. And they practice jobs. They practice prioritizing. They get to know each other a little bit, and it just opens up all kinds of things. Teaching vocabulary, yeah, absolutely. Vocabulary, prioritizing, saying, I like this because, justification, giving reasons, you know, reason and purpose, or this job would not suit me because it involved dot, 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 naming skills. There's a lot of things you can use here. Loads and loads. If you're doing business English, you can do business jobs. And then teaching all of those skills. Well, if I were a, per, you know, a personal assist, assistant, I would have to keep my boss's diary. I would have to be organized. I would have to know how to create PowerPoint slides. All that vocabulary. Conversational English. Absolutely. Definitely. Okay, we're going to go on to the mind organization activities, which we're getting towards the end here. And this first one is the radical reformer who likes to go out and sell things. Right, there it goes. So first I would brainstorm the language. I would talk about USPs, unique selling uh, points or propositions of products. Buy the group into buyers and sellers. Buyers can buy three different products. Price doesn't matter. There is no price. Sellers, the classroom, find something they can sell. Give them a time limit. Find out who sold and who didn't sell. It's a business English activity, but it can be used for anyone getting them speaking, saying, if you buy this product, you will dot, dot, dot. And the reason I have a paper clip here is I did it with a group of personal assistants or secretaries that I was teaching, and they sold a paper clip because they sold it as a boyfriend finder. They discovered that there was a very cute guy that fixed the photocopier, 
And if they put the paper clip in in just the right way, the machine would stop working and they'd have to call whatever his name was, Hans or so, to come and fix it. And everybody wanted to buy the boyfriend finder. So it was a really one that had all kinds of ideas. It was used to keep the automatic blinds from moving. They used it to hold certain things in place. It was used for everything except what it was meant for. It was wonderful. And we had so much fun with it. And a very easy game to do again. And the last activity I'm going to show you, I'm basically on time, um, is the personal mind map. That is not moving. There we go. This is from Spotlight on Learning Styles. I do this with my class. Okay. okay. Um, I do it to introduce interviews. So I write my name. And I put all kinds of information around now. Is there any question for me about any of these things here? Nellie actually answered one at the beginning. You do this too, yeah. I love this activity. So the idea is to have them ask questions. When was my teacher training? Oh, boy. Um, it's still going on. I think it started in, let me think, uh, 1973. And I would say I am still taking part in teacher training. So, long time. So, I have these questions. What is Opera Camerata? This is an opera group I ran in New York. What, was 19, what does 1975 mean? 1975 is when I moved to New York City, and so on and so forth. Then they write their own personal mind map, and they, um, I mean, the questions have to be based on this. So teacher training, okay. Um, what does teacher training mean? I would say I've been doing teacher training since 1985 or so. Then they write their own, and they interview partners. Now, the advantage of this is some of these games that we do have got fixed questions, and there are students who might not want to answer them. I teach a variety of students. I've had students who really do not want to talk about their childhood if they grew up in, a, in conflict situations, which I have here in Austria. I've got a lot from former Yugoslavia. Um, other places where they really don't want to go into that. So here, they get to pick and choose what they are willing to talk about, which is fair to them. And it inspires the conversation. It gets them going. Because these are the aspects of their life they want to share. And this is so important to get them talking. Okay. I, it would help them avoid those. Yeah, exactly. It does. It, 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 it doesn't come up. They choose what they want to talk about. Let me start learning NLP. Oh, boy. It came from learning styles. Uh, a colleague was using it, my friend that I do all the training with, and I went to a class which I found interesting things in about establishing rapport. It, it kind of, what it does is it codifies the things that we are used to doing, like establishing rapport, but you learn how to do it. You learn how to reach somebody in the world they're living in. You start looking at things in a different way. You realize where someone's coming from in a completely different way than you did before. Uh, it's wonderful with a goal setting model. It's wonderful for clarifying things. I just found it to be a very helpful thing in my life. And it keeps coming up. And in Austria, interestingly enough, a lot of business people have done NLP training. And now with all the coaching that's so popular, I, I'm on that level. So in a class, when someone says, oh, that's just like I learned in NLP or in coaching, I can say, yes, exactly, and dot, dot, dot. And they look at me differently. I'm not just an English teacher. I'm also an NLP teacher. And it changes the dynamic, which is Fine. I'm not saying that's a reason to do it. It has been helpful for me as a freelance business image trainer. Okay, so going on now, these were the activities we looked at. It's not moving again for some reason. Okay. No, you might have to. Okay, those were the activities. Oops, we need to go back. Nelly, can you put it back? I'm afraid it's not going to work. back one more. Okay, those are the activities we did. Just to remind everyone, 
because a question's coming, and where they fit in the classroom. It's actually the style. I think it raises awareness. Students begin to realize and say, oh, okay, he does that because he needs to see it. I don't need to see it, so I don't need to do it in that way. They become very active. It can increase their motivation. It's very learner-centered, and it helps them to become to develop their own strategies, to realize. I had a very analytic, kinesthetic student who had problems with the word analysis, which for non-English speakers is really difficult. I told her to do it kinesthetically, walking home from work, to say analysis, analysis, but to actually move on the syllable. She loved it. She practiced it. She felt great, and she got it in her body. And it was so important for her. It made all the difference in the world. I could have explained it a million times. That wasn't what she needed. She needed to do it. Okay, I would like to go on to this next one, which I believe is the reflection. I want to see. Yes. Okay, so can you type some things in here? What you would enjoy doing if these activities reflect your type, what would work for you, and ideas for adapting. Oh, you have so much patience. Oh, okay. Mind that. And do you know what kind of learner you think you are, Cheryl? Let's all mind that. And this is too much the, I didn't mention, that was the flexible friend. Also global. Okay. We do the similar ones. Great. Changing things. Yeah, I agree, Nellie. That's radical reformer, which you may very well be with some flexible friend in there. Yeah, I agree. I, I, mean, I, If I kept doing the same thing over and over, I couldn't be doing it for 34 years. And I realized yesterday, it was a long week. I have not had a day off, I think now in, I can't remember, a month or something. I had so much fun working with my students yesterday with, with two different groups. 38 years. Okay. I'm only counting here, but yes, yes, it's a long time. Different methods, right. Also for us, it's so important. Always an adventure. Okay. Anything else here that anyone says? In the past, I've been others. Knowing mm -hmm. my soulmate. <laughs> Bobby, <laughs> you and me too. Teaching EFL so much fun. Yeah. It really is. You get bored? Okay. Yeah. So we change things. And you can see the books I've got behind me and the activities all cut up and laminated. And okay. Okay. Well, I think we can. Okay. Former investigator. Okay. It would be interesting to hear from you guys after this if you can take the uh, the surveys and let me know what you are. Uh, the research. Project I'm doing with my students. They get these three surveys that are always going to get to you somehow. Don't ask me about the tech stuff. Um, and they do these three surveys, and then I give them a self reflection page where they have to fill in the strategies that they use during the year and which activities help them learn during the semester and why. And I showed it to a colleague, and she said, oh, of course, pair work. They all choose pair work. I said, but look at what helped them learn. One wrote, I like the pair work because I worked with another person and we spoke together. Another one wrote, I like the pair work because the other person helped me. Another one wrote, I like the pair work because I remember the little pictures. So the reasons that they felt it helped them were widely different, even though the activity was the same. And this is why when I hear people say, Learning styles don't work or whatever. They're not supposed to work. They just happen to be there. They are part of who we are and how we react to things. Otherwise, we'd all be exactly the same, which I don't think is true. I really don't. You don't understand the same. It's okay, more private. 
Yes. Exactly. You may analyze the different. Yeah, of course. Don't want everyone the same. I agree. That'd be pretty boring. As you say, opposites attract. Okay, so going on to the very end here. Let's see if I can get this going. Okay, so this was the question. Does anyone have any questions? We've got six minutes. Okay, type in actual. How about solitary? What do you mean? What what's the I mean, those are the expert investigators or the very analytics. Um, in my classes, I tell them that I understand that they don't get to do a lot on their own, that they don't get to work by themselves very often because we have so little time in class and we use that for activities. But they get lots of homework where they do it on their own at home. Um, I upload links to Vicki Howard's videos. I don't have them here. Um, they can watch them. They get self, well, self-correcting exercises, so exercises with the answer keys and so on. That so will end in five minutes. Okay. So we have to go on. I'd like to go to the acknowledgments. Okay, that is my email if you want to contact me with questions. I am now working on a book with Wade Foos Press in the States on how to design activities for different types. The spotlight on learning styles that Fabiana mentioned is here. If you can see it, I can't get it in front of the webcam. This has the surveys, background information, and the activities. This new one is about how to design activities. So, yes. Kids just don't want other people to seem serious. That's your expert investigators. They, as I said, they want somebody who seems to be an expert. So I tried to come across as an expert on this while being friendly. I tried to combine. I do. And if I don't know, I admit it. I tell them. But I also have lots of links I can give them. And I gave them links yesterday to the Cambridge Dictionary. I said, I can't tell you that one. But here is a link where you can look it up yourself. We also need to be honest. Teams, yeah. We are teams. I'm not sure what you mean about teams. That works for the type, the learners who, the global, the um, uh, the flexible friends, the kinesthetic emotionals, and so on. They like to work together with people they like. Just want to give you the acknowledgement so you have the links. Not, okay, there we go. So. Here is the eltpix.com. Have a look. There are loads and loads and loads of pictures you can use. Pick up with people they like. Um, sometimes you have to. It depends. It really depends. Thank you, Helena. Um, mine, I mean, my university students, this is not an issue. But with kids, I have heard sometimes they want to do that. Now, cooperative learning is a way. We can do that in another webinar. A way to get them working with different groups. And sometimes they need to learn to do that. They don't always get to work with people they like. They also need to learn to work with those they don't like. But it depends. I mean, start off by harmonizing. Start off by making them comfortable and then letting them stretch. I wouldn't challenge them on the first day of class. I'd start off with getting them comfortable. Anyone have any other questions? We are down to 12 seconds here. 